Welcome to the Resch Center. In the shadow of the historic Lambeau Field in Green Bay, Wisconsin, as this is where we find ourselves for the 39th Stadium Review episode and the 6th out of 16 in my quest to visit all of the USHL stadiums. As today, we're seeing the Green Bay Gamblers. And of course, the Stadium Review is brought to you in partnership with Pulltab Sports. Be sure to check them out at PulltabSports.com for all your content on Midwest sports and culture, and be sure to give all their social media accounts a follow as they help make all these videos possible. We started out the evening at The Bar. Yes, the place is just called The Bar. It's right across the way from the stadium and it was pretty nice because we were able to park the car at the bar and just walk across the way to the stadium. And they had good food and good drinks. While walking up to the stadium, across the street from it, you have the Packers practice facility. And straight down the road is historic Lambeau Field. I thought this main exterior entranceway was absolutely beautiful with the giant rounded glass atrium and really sleek exterior design. Attached to the arena on the Lambeau Field side is the Resch Expo Center, which is a giant exposition center which opened up in January of 2021 and is a massive space for trade shows and large events. And just outside that area, there's a statue of Bart Starr, who was the quarterback of the Packers from 1956 to 71 and the head coach from 1975 to 83. And the gambler's mascot Ace was out front, welcoming everyone into the arena. As we make our way into the stadium on the concourse, we want to take a quick chance and remind you to subscribe to the channel if you're not already because we have lots more stadium reviews coming up just like this one that you're really going to enjoy. And also a massive shout out to my dude Steven for going to the arena and giving me a bunch of helpful tips. You enter the stadium through this large main atrium area, it was extremely open and had a lot of natural light coming in. That's where the team shop was and check out this slick vintage jersey, absolutely gorgeous. Per usual, we want the puck, they had the official game puck for only $5, which is a pretty good deal. We made our way out of that atrium, down the hall, and up the steps to the main level concourse. Out of all the USHL arenas that I've been to so far, this is the first one that the concourse feels like an actual legit stadium. These halls had extremely high ceilings, big beams going throughout, and lots of windows letting in lots of natural light. The interior also had bricks lining it, which was a really nice touch. There were several sections that were closed off, but we'll get to those a little bit later when we talk about seating. I really love just how open and spacious this whole area is, and it's extremely inviting and looks extremely clean and crisp. The only thing it's lacking is that I feel like it's a real missed opportunity to have a big open window looking out to Lambeau Field. However, with the convention center now there, that makes it a lot more difficult. But you do have a good window out to the visiting team's bus. I hope you're hungry, because it's time to talk about food. They had a lot of different uniquely themed food stands. But I was pretty full since we got dinner beforehand, and if you're familiar with these videos, you know what's going on here. We have to review the hot dog, as we do for every USHL game that we attend. Starting out for price, look at this, a $2 hot dog. I was absolutely buzzing about this price. Cheapest hot dog so far, 5 out of 5 when it comes to price. On to presentation now, it didn't come in a foil, but kind of like a waxy type paper. And if we look close at the dog itself, it's got kind of these white bumps and a very dark red color to it, which is a little interesting and not the most flattering. So we're going to give it two out of five. As for the bun, it's your staple that you buy at the grocery store. Nothing special. Once again, two out of five. So I should say some. And that's not what we're looking for at all here. One out of five for the meat. It was extremely chewy and it just felt weird. The texture was off, didn't have much flavor. It's the hardest, chewiest dollar I have. While I appreciate it being only two dollars, it kind of makes sense because the quality just wasn't there. This isn't it. All right, now let's tally her up and divide by two to get a final score of five out of ten. And this puts us at fifth place so far out of six in the standings. Only better than Dubuque's dog, and to be honest, the reason that this was saved here from last place was definitely the price. Two dollars, I like that price. And by the way, I figured everyone would appreciate me throwing on a Green Bay Packer hat here. Had to make sure we fit in with the home crowd. Alright, let's head off the concourse and get into the seating bowl itself. It's laid out in one giant bowl with the entrances in the middle of the sections. For a USHL rink, this is actually quite a few rows of seating and it's really steep which makes you feel like you're right over the action. And this is actually the third largest rink in the USHL, coming in behind Sioux Falls and Sioux City, as the rest center seats a total of 8,709. And a little bit of fun fact I discovered is that Elton John actually holds the record for getting the most people into the building as 10,414 people attended his show in 2003 after the building had recently just opened back in 2002. But I am going to go breaking your heart here. <laughs> you like what I did? 
as some of the seats at one end are all tarped off. Starting out on the ice itself, I made an interesting discovery that the red center line on the near side is white with red diamonds, while the far side is red with white diamonds. I'm not sure why, but it was definitely interesting and I wanted to make note of it. The team benches don't have any tunnel going to them, and they actually look extremely cramped. Like a little goalie squish there, I feel bad for the poor guy. But the entrances to the dressing rooms are at the corners of the ice, which means we get to watch the coaches do the penguin waddle. However, I do think it's a little bit of a missed opportunity that they don't have any private area or table in between the two benches where they have a large gap. But there are a ton of private seating areas right on the glass, as there's some behind both nets and also down one of the sides just a little bit. The seats themselves are kind of interesting as they're a little curvy and small, but they're comfortable enough and get the job done. Above the seating bowl on the far side, we have several different private suites in the captain's corner with Captain Morgan. And there was also some private areas on the near side as well, and this was also where the press box was. I actually discovered that you can walk all the way up to this large landing at the top of the seating section, as it's where a lot of the scouts and the ADA seating is. So of course I had to go there and check it out, but first check out the loneliest seat in the venue. Ooh, this guy looks like he's taking some good notes, maybe we'll steal him. Don't bump any of the cameramen now. Here are some more scouties up here, quick peek at this guy's notes, and that's about all to see up here. They do have a really nice hanging center scoreboard that a lot of junior teams don't have, and the rafters are lined with banners of the Gamblers and also the IFL Green Bay Blizzard that have played here since 2003, as well as the University of Wisconsin Green Bay Phoenix men's and women's basketball teams who have played here since 2002, just like the Gamblers. I was actually really intrigued and awestruck by the inside ceiling itself. There's just a lot of these white sound panels and also a ton of beams and supports for the ceiling structure. We got into the game early for warm-ups and already I was really impressed with all the nuances as the team did a great job really leaning into that gambler's branding by having the player stats on a playing card. And we got our first look at one of a viewer's younger brother who actually plays for the gamblers. And Ace and the Ice Crew were out trying to get everyone hyped up before the game started. I did think the team intro was a little weak and anticlimactic as the lights were still on for it. But we did have an early nominee for the Fan of Game Award as this guy was dressed up like a wrestler on wrestling night and he was absolutely feeding it to the Muskegon players as they came onto the ice. The gamblers jumped out to an early lead and we were right in the middle of all the cowbells which were firing at all cylinders. I'm not sure what the deal is with this money in the bank thing but I think it's absolutely hilarious. The gamblers took a 3-0 lead from our guy number 5, Carter Rose. And the money in the bank here was very appropriate since one of the gamblers players got absolutely deposited into the ice, cleaning up a lot of room for Rose to get the puck in the slot and bury it. Well, he's kind of got to be my player of the game because of the connection. How could you not love number 20? Player. What a great name. But an even better name on the team, number 27, Mr. No Name. When we had the flex cam later in the first period, our wrestling guy definitely submitted himself as fan of the game. Look at these moves. This guy's got it. 100% muscle. He's our fan of the game. During one of the first intermissions, they had one of the funniest promotions I've ever seen, as they played Hungry Hungry Hippo. Kids were on their stomach on these flat scooters, as their parents would drag them around by their feet to collect all the balls in the center of the ice. Yay! I was hardcore cheering for the pink one, because a little bit of a side story is I loved the game Hungry Hungry Hippos when I was young. I'd always play the pink one, it was always my favorite, but of course I'd win because I'd just sit there and pound on the thing repeatedly. I remember once I actually flipped the whole game, and I think my mom actually banned me from playing Hungry Hungry Hippos because I was too aggressive with it. But hey, this kind of brought me back here, as my pink hippo was definitely the best. Let me know in the comments if you had a favorite Hungry Hungry Hippo color. But I mean, regardless of what your answer is, we all know the pink one is the best. Just don't go flipping the boards and breaking things. Way to be pink. Go get him. Yes. Yes. Drag her back. Pink team has 35. Let's go. Let's go, pink. Let's go. In the second period, we had the famous beer can race, as four fans dressed up in these giant beer can costumes and raced across the ice. Get set. 
Looking back at this now, where the heck is the Miller in this spotted cow? Come on, this is Wisconsin. That's an easy win for Bush though. Or shall I say, Bush. During our traditional second period section hop, the Lumberjacks started to show a little bit of life. And that's when I was up by the scouts and found all the official rosters. Things got a little bit spicy as the Lumberjacks continued to make a game out of it, pulling the score to a 5-3 game. And look at our wrestler dude here, rock on man, love it. And do you remember our squished backup goalie friend from earlier? Well he actually got into the game and I definitely got a huge kick at the previous team he played for. Honey baked ham. <laughs> He's a honey baked ham. <laughs> During second intermission, they had chuck a puck, and the pucks were only one dollar, so there were a ton of pucks being thrown onto the ice. And maybe a few that didn't quite make it to the ice. Right here, buddy boy! Come on, fire that gun! And can you really have a sporting event in the city of Wisconsin if you don't play jump around? The answer is obviously no. Muskegon was trying to make a push late in the game, but an empty net goal by the Gamblers sealed off the deal. And it was actually a hat trick on top of that, as a few hats came sprinkling down onto the ice. And a few young fans struggled to get theirs over and threw it at the wrong time. The beer cup pyramid on the glass is normally a tradition here, but made a late appearance in the game. The Gamblers sealed off the game with an 8-3 win, and this victory actually qualified them to make it into the playoffs. So the boys were absolutely buzzing about it. And of course, after congratulating the goaltender, the first thing to do is to go knock down that beer cup tower. And that does it for our time here at the Rest Center in Green Bay, Wisconsin. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and let me know what your favorite thing about this stadium was. And I'll see you very soon for another stadium review video. Thanks. Bye.